Along with my co-chair, Karen Gaudian, and all of our volunteers, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Lyme disease has been an important topic in Karen's and my life since our families were stricken over 10 years ago. Most concerning was how seriously our children were impacted and how little we knew about the disease. Yes, we knew about ticks and expected we'd see a bullseye rash if one bit us. We knew about flu-like symptoms and achy joints. And we thought a few weeks of antibiotics would do the trick. Karen never anticipated that her young daughters would miss years of school, lose their ability to read, and spend much of their childhood isolated from norm normal social activities. I certainly never expected my oldest daughter's college experience would be derailed by an illness she left Ridgeville with her senior year an illness that left her unable to memorize for tests or think clearly enough to complete assignments. As mothers, Karen and I thought we knew about Lyme disease before our families got sick, but we really didn't. We didn't know that not everyone gets a rash, not everyone notices early symptoms, and while Lyme spreads through your body, every system from head to toe can be impacted. We didn't know it could change our children's lives. I like to think that, to paraphrase Maya Angelou, if we'd known better, we would have done better. That's why, when Ridgefield's first selectman, Rudy Marconi, asked us to start this task force in 2003, we agreed. We didn't want other families to find out too late how damaging tick-borne diseases can be. And we spent the past 13 years doing our best to educate the community and support patients. Patients who are often as shocked as we were that what we thought was a minor illness turned out to be a life-changing experience. I've been incredibly proud of our town's response to this problem. Mr. Marconi has addressed it openly and done everything in his power to support our work. Not every town leader would decide to tackle this health issue head on. I'm also very proud of the terrific partners who supported our mission, posting warning signs on trails, raising money, organizing seminars, teaching the blast prevention tips at town events, and running our support groups. Lyme Connection is an unfunded volunteer town committee. Two years ago, we had the good fortune to meet two Ridgeville families whose commitment to helping the community launch the educational effort you're taking part in tonight. One whose daughter was suffering terribly with Lyme disease, and the other, her close friends, who felt they had to do something meaningful to help. The second family, the Dranows, on a global research firm based in Ridgeville, Smart Revenue. And they suggested their contribution could be collecting information that would help everyone better understand tick-borne diseases. <clears throat> this idea grew into the terrific collaborative effort we're calling a model community response to end Lyme disease. The Dranos research team, Western Connecticut Health Network, and Lyme Connection began a pilot project that now includes researchers with a broad range of perspectives and an interest in, interest in combining resources. The Dranos also introduced Lyme Connection to the amazing creative team at Discovery Communications, resulting in the exciting social media Lyme awareness campaign we'll be launching tonight with your help. The Ridgeville Library enthusiastically volunteered to host events for our new initiative, committing to a two-year Lyme awareness campaign. They plan to share this programming model with libraries across the state. And Amanda Grano partnered with her dear friend Rachel Balpone to serve as volunteer co-chairs for this wonderful series of prevention and patient support activities. I hope you've all picked up a copy of this brochure listing what's coming up because it's really an impressive list of prevention and patient support uh, initiatives that the library is hosting. And all of them, except there will be a Lyme Connection patient conference at Westcon on May 19th that's not included uh, here at the library, but everything else is being hosted by the library. It's very impressive. So tonight you're taking part in our first community event organized under this new model community banner. We chose this date because we know the media is, is filling with warnings about ticks this time of year. Scary stories about meat allergies and the deadly Colossum virus. And you're trying to wade through the news and make important decisions for your family. We want you to take tick borne <coughs> diseases seriously, but we want you to understand what the risks really are and make smart decisions about proven, effective behaviors. That's why we've invited Ridgefield resident and scientific advisor to our BLAST program, Dr. Nita Connolly, to talk with you tonight. Dr. Connolly is an assistant professor of biology at Western Connecticut State University. Her primary research interests focus on the backyard prevention of Lyme and other tick-borne diseases in the Northeastern United States. 
She holds a Master of Science in Public Health from Tulane University of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, as well as a PhD in Entomology from the University of Rhode Island. Prior to joining the faculty at WestCon, Dr. Connolly was an associate research scientist working on Lyme disease prevention at Yale School of Public Health. She collaborates on ongoing projects with colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Connecticut Emerging Infections Program at Yale School of Public Health, and with the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dr. Connolly. <laughs> Karen and Lime Connection and Smart Revenue and everybody who's here and of course the library for hosting this uh, event. That's where we have a lot of technology going on today, so we'll, uh, we'll do our best. <clears throat> so as Jennifer said, I'm a professor of biology at uh, Western Connecticut State and I have a lab there in this lab. Uh, we focus upon various activities related to the ecology and prevention of tick-borne illnesses in the northeastern United States. Um, as Jennifer told you, my training and educational background is in medical entomology. Medical entomology uh, studies the field, or excuse me, insects and other arthropods that transmit diseases to humans. And I also have a degree in public health. And so, uh, in the research that we do uh, at Western. Uh, really ranges. I've been really fortunate to have collaborations and projects and funding uh, through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to carry out activities related to all sorts of uh, Lyme disease intervention studies. Uh, we do repellent activities. We have tick monitoring that goes on every year in three locations here in Connecticut. We're actually expanding that this year. Um, and uh, we have a lot going on, and I don't have time to tell you all about it today, but I'd be happy to share it. Um, that would be if we'd like to talk another time. But <laughs> my education and training has really led me to uh, focus my research in one place. And really, that's at the crossroads of where the biology of ticks meets human behavior. And so I've been working on this topic since um, 1998. And uh, I hope I'll be continuing to do this. Uh, because as we know, uh, tick borne diseases haven't gone away. In fact, they have been increasing, their ranges are expanding. And so I really wear two hats here, and one is um, as a scientist, as you know, but also I'm a resident of Richfield. I'm really excited to be here in particular to talk about this topic, but I'm a mom, I have two school-aged kids, the age of 85, and uh, we're just as concerned about preventing Lyme disease and other illnesses transmitted by this blood-sucking uh, parasite. <laughs> So you may have received one of these when you came in, something that looks something like that. Uh, it's called a clicker. I use these with my students, so I thought it'd be fun to try and, uh, and use them in today's talk so we can interact a little bit. So if you have one, uh, if you take a look at it, don't touch any buttons yet, I'll just point out. <laughs> I know, it's tempting, right? If you don't have one and you'd like to have one. So yours may have a little window here. It may not, doesn't matter. But you'll see there's a little LED light either on this side or this side. There's no on or off button. When you um, push a button, it will automatically record your response. This is kind of like who wants to be a millionaire? <laughs> All right, so, so you know that your response has been received because the little light right here, or it might be on this side, will turn green, okay? So don't do anything until I tell you because I have to open up the poll, so don't answer yet. Hold on, let's see if we can make this work. Okay, go ahead, where do you live? When it's my students, there's a timer that like 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start screaming when the timer gets close. All right. All right, good. You got it? Did your light turn green? Yes. You got it. Cool. Here we go. So let's see. Oh, oh I did it again. Oh, I broke it. Let's do it one more time. Go ahead. Enter one more time. That was my fault. Sorry. Right, do it one more time. Yep. Yes. All right. You can change your answer if you're not satisfied. <laughs> All right. You got it? Let's see if we're all from Ridgefield. There we go. Can you see that when I see it? No. Is it supposed to light up the second time? 
of all ages, but we consistently see what we call a bimodal distribution, that is most cases being reported from children under the age of 10, as well as adults uh, over the age of 50, between 50 and 75. And this really, we think, has to do with our outdoor activities and uh, probability of being exposed to infected ticks. Now, I'm not a medical doctor, and I'm not going to talk about so much about uh, diagnosis and treatment of Lyme disease, and I know that there's uh, some upcoming talks. You can also talk to Jennifer Reed and, and Karen at the glass booth if you want to talk uh, more about diagnosis and treatment. But we know that the earliest sign of Lyme disease is known as, uh, some call it the bullseye rash. The medical term is erythema migrans. It's, it's an expanding, uh, usually painless, usually not itchy red rash. Often it has central clearing, but sometimes it does not. And if left unnoticed, it will go away. But that doesn't mean that the infection has gone away. This symptom shows up in what we believe is most people, uh, estimates are 60 to 80 percent of people. It doesn't necessarily show up. It also may not show up at the site of the tick bite. In addition to that, if you had a tick bite on your back or behind your knee or in your hair uh, and the rash shows up there, you may not be likely to find it. But we know this is our earliest symptom and our most treatable symptom. Of course, symptoms uh, can range from what Jennifer said was flu-like to very serious uh, cardiac and neurological complications if left undiagnosed and untreated. Diagnosis and treatment uh, relies on early recognition, hopefully uh, by a clinician, by laboratory tests, and there's various uh, treatments with antibiotics depending on what stage of disease. The thing about uh, this tick, the black-legged tick or deer tick, um, is that it doesn't only transmit the agent that causes Lyme disease. Uh, it causes, excuse me, it transmits not only Lyme bacteria, but also parasites that cause a disease known as babesiosis, uh, bacteria that cause something called anaplasmosis. It was formerly called, you may have heard it called ehrlichiosis before. Um, there was a recently recognized Borrelia that causes relapsing fever. And uh, you may have also heard, and Jennifer mentioned, about Powassan virus. Now this is a disease. Infections are more rare than Lyme infections, uh, but they can be uh, more serious. And so we're not going to talk about all the symptoms of these, because ideally, our goal here is to prevent tick bites. Because one tick may be carrying one of these organisms, or it may be carrying all of them. So our goal really is to prevent uh, being infected, or excuse me, being exposed to an infected tick. So I love this cartoon from The New Yorker. Uh, because it really puts us uh, in a place where we can consider what we did. So it says, we're thinking of moving, this is the neighbor talking to one another, right? We're thinking of moving to another part of the country, somewhere between Lyme disease and killer bees, right? So wherever you live in the country, you have something you have to worry about, right? It might be killer bees, it might be Zika virus, it might be uh, tornadoes. And maybe here in the Northeast, we worry about Lyme disease. But one of the things we love about living in the Northeast is it's very beautiful, and we love our landscape. The thing is, our landscape is really what's contributed to the increase in disease transmission over the last several decades now. Uh, so I'm going to teach you a little bit about uh, the biology and ecology of the tick. And when you understand that, you can really have a better understanding of how to prevent yourself and your family from being exposed to that infected tick. Okay, so first, here's your next Quiz. Who's seen a black-legged tick, also known as a deer tick? Who's seen one? Do you think you could identify one if you saw it? Here's a quiz. Hold on, don't do it yet. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Oh, wait, did not do it again. There we go. Which one of these is a black-legged? And these are proportionally to scale, so relative to one another. If you were to put them all next to one another, they look kind of like that. Mm -hmm. See what you think, right? Mm -hmm. They have an energy response. Make sure 
they get the green light. All right. So it's kind of was a trick question, actually. Did you know that? <laughs> so it's a trick question because actually A, B, and C are all black-legged ticks. This here is the American dog tick. And I'm going to show you some more about that. Are you surprised? Okay, so you may think, oh, I know deer ticks. They're out in the summer and they're really, really small. Have you thought that before? Like this. That's true. The thing is, there's other stages of the tick, like the adult stage that's out right now, that also carries Lyme bacteria. In fact, they're twice as likely to be infected. Um, and that when they engorge with blood after being attached for several days to their host, they look like this, which is quite large. And a lot of people pull these off themselves or their dogs, their children, and they say, that's huge. There's no way that can be a deer tick. It must be a dog tick. It might be a wood tick. And they promptly throw it in the garbage. So if this happens, you should inspect it carefully, okay? Because it very well may be a deer tick. So let's look at some more pictures of that. There we go. So here's, these are millimeters. You can see there are four stages of the tick, a bunch of three stages because these are both adults. Uh, we have a six-legged larval stage, and I have some back over there uh, at the last booth. You can see different stages. You almost can <coughs> barely see these with the human eye. They rarely feed upon humans. Uh, usually they feed upon mice. They don't transmit Lyme bacteria to humans. Uh, here's the eight-legged nymph stage. This is the one that's most implicated in causing uh, disease. And then we have the male and female tick. And you can see that after feeding for several days, this female can blow right up. So if you're not sure, how can you distinguish the black-legged tick from the American dog tick? Well, there's a couple of ways you can do that. If you look, oh, what just happened? Okay. Document recovery, it says. Okay. Uh, so, you can see the mouth parts on the black-legged tick are longer than the dog tick, but the real telltale sign is this. If you look at the back of either the male or the female dog tick, it has what we call an ornate sputum. The sputum is like, it's almost like fingernails. It covers the back of the tick. <coughs> and the females, they only cover half of the back because we need the rest of the, the back of the tick to be expandable so it can fill with blood. And you can see it's sort of white in color and metallic right here. And even when the tick engorges, you'll be able to see that white decoration on the back of the tick. Okay. So if we can understand the life cycle of the black-legged tick, Exodia scapularis, we also can uh, better understand how to prevent uh, encountering one and being bitten by one. So this tick lives a long time. It has a two-year life cycle, which is pretty long for any sort of uh, arthropod. So the tick has uh, three major life stages, the larvae, the nymph, and the adult. The eggs are laid uh, by the adults, usually in the fall or winter. Um, they hatch in the spring, and the larvae hatch usually around August, and they're active through September. So those larvae uh, exist in the leaf litter, very low to the ground, and they feed primarily upon small mammals, especially white-footed mice. Actually, if you look closely, you can see ticks on the ears of this mouse. Uh, they feed upon the mice. Uh, they also feed upon all sorts of small mammals like shrews and voles, chipmunks, squirrels. They also feed upon a variety of birds. Uh, they're not picky eaters. They will feed on any bird, mammal, or reptile that may come in its path. So it, it feeds, each stage only feeds one time. 
So it attaches to its host, it feeds for several days, after which it falls off and molts into its next stage. The thing is, these larvae, after they've molted, will overwinter as nymphs, and these nymphs emerge uh, usually right around May. We really, so in a couple of weeks, we're going to see the nymphs come out. Uh, they really start picking up uh, in abundance around um, Memorial Day. That's when we really start looking for them. The nymphs then will also be <coughs> low to the ground. They usually attach to white-footed mice and other small animals and birds. They feed for several days. They then fall off, and they roll to their next stage, the adult. The adults are active from October all the way through April. Now, if it's freezing, like freezing like below 40 degrees, and there's snow on the ground, the ticks will not be out. But if you're aware, if you remember Christmas Day, here it was like 65 degrees. Mm -hmm. It was a perfect day to get ticks. And actually, we had many ticks sent to our lab at Western uh, by people who had encountered ticks while just recreating in the middle of winter. So just because it's winter doesn't mean that the ticks aren't out. It can be very cold. You can be out there in 45 degrees uh, and encounter one of these. The adults uh, are found upon uh, primarily white-tailed deer. And that has to do with their questing behavior. They look for a host higher up in the vegetation, as where the immature stages are lower in, in the vegetation. Uh, the adults feed on the deer. The, male, the males only go on the uh, deer to, uh, to mate with the female. But the females will feed, attach, they will engorge. Occasionally, we see male ticks attached, but they don't engorge with blood. <coughs> OK, so I want to just introduce this concept of reservoir host. So a reservoir host is a host of a tick that can become infected with Lyme bacteria, but also can be infected, meaning infected to other ticks, okay? So white-footed mice are the most important reservoir host for Borrelia burgdorferi, and that's the Borrelia burgdorferi being the causative agent of Lyme disease. So the reason is these mice actually can circulate the bacteria in their bloodstream for almost their duration of their whole life. And so you can imagine if there are several ticks feeding upon them um, to completion, they're sure to become infected. And so white-tailed deer, are the, or excuse me, white-footed mice are the primary reservoir host. But we know from several studies that there are many reservoir-competent animals. And these, as you can see, there's a whole list here from chipmunks to various species of bird. There's probably more. It's just that nobody's tested them. Now, deer, on the other hand, are not what we call reservoir competent. They can become infected with the bacteria, but something about their immune system causes them to clear the infection, so they don't remain infected to other ticks that may feed upon them. However, deer are important reproductive hosts for this tick. That means that the adult female feeds upon this uh, deer for several days to get a blood meal so that she can lay her eggs. One adult female tick can lay 3,000 eggs. So you can imagine um, that a lot of these deer running around here will have hundreds of adult female ticks upon them. So you can see how deer really contribute to the abundance of ticks in an area. So we really have this uh, you know, perfect recipe for Lyme disease. We have lots of deer, we have lots of mice. And so back to the life cycle, we can see how the causative agent of Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, can circulate through this natural cycle without humans being involved at all. So let's imagine that this X signifies an infection with the Lyme-causing bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi. So these mice are running around and they are infected for their whole life. And a larva feeds upon that mouse. Now that larva is infected. It retains that infection through its molt to the next stage. So now that nymph is infected and is ready to infect. So that nymph will then feed upon its meal, usually a white-footed mouse, which it can then infect. Um, and then it will also retain that infection into the adult stage. And so adults are twice as likely to be infected because now they've had two chances to pick up the infection from animals. Everyone see that? So what happens is we kind of get in the middle of this cycle. So this is going on, you know, in nature in the forest behind our houses. And if we accidentally uh, encounter one of these ticks, we then can become infected. So it's the nymph that's the stage that's been most implicated in causing 
human disease. So when we look at the stages of the tick, here's the adults, here's the nymphs, here's the larva, larvae, you can see the risk is highest in these summer months. So why do you think it's the nymph that causes most people to get sick? Yeah, look, they're teeny tiny. They're about the size of a poppy seed, right? What about the timing? Yeah, this is the time we're all outside recreating, right? Great. So the thing is, I and this we hear this all the time. Well, you know, I'm worried about Lyme disease, so when I go hiking, I always bring my repellent and I put it on me and I put it on my kids. And the thing is, we know that. Uh, most people who encounter an infected tick do so in their own backyard. And so we call this highest risk for Lyme disease in the northeastern United States, we call that risk perigenestic, and that literally means around the home. And so we know from various studies that about 90% of ticks in the residential landscape are found right at the border where lawn meets woods. This was one of my field sites when I was a graduate student. And you can see uh, the homeowners had placed their children's place at right there in this area that's sort of the hot zone for ticks. Okay, and so um, we really, when we focus upon prevention, we really want to focus in that peridomestic environment. So precautions should be taken in the peridomestic environment, that is, in your own backyard, and not just when you go off to do some sort of recreational activity like, like going hiking or camping. So why do we have so much Lyme disease here? Why do we keep in encountering these infected ticks? Well, really, the story has to do with the amount of forest cover in Connecticut. So you can see we had a lot of forest here. Um, we reduced the amount of forest, and particularly in Connecticut, because we, of course, were more of an agricultural society. And then in the last, you know, 100 years, our forests have been growing back. So all those stone walls, you know, are the borders of old pastures back from when uh, we were uh, conducting more agricultural practice. So our forest cover has been on the rise, and with uh, the reintroduction of our forest, our deciduous forest, we have now um, a high abundance of white-tailed deer. So, here's your quiz. Don't do it yet. <laughs> How many deer do you think lived in Connecticut in the year 1900? since uh, we have known about it. Okay. 
So there was a, you may remember, in the late 90s, there was a vaccination that one could get. Smith, Klein, Beecham had launched a vaccine. You needed three shots. You had to be at least 15 years of age. And it wasn't, uh, once you got all three shots, it was still less than 80% effective. A few years later, uh, the maker uh, took it off the market, stating uh, low sales. Uh, there were also some lawsuits. So there is no longer a vaccine. So in the absence of a vaccine, we have to look at the life cycle of the tick and figure out where are the places that we can focus our efforts. We can focus them where ticks meet humans. We can focus them where ticks meet hosts. And so all of the research now that's been conducted on preventing tick-borne illness has to look at these various stages of the life cycle of the tick and their hosts. So I'm going to tell you briefly just about uh, the different methods of prevention. And I'm just going to give you some common sense practical tips that you can do um, because you can't necessarily do everything. So maybe you can take a few things away uh, that you can do that are reasonable. So we can put our prevention uh, practices into three categories. One is landscape modification, the other is chemical control, and the last one is personal protection. So what are landscape modifications? Uh, here's a nice illustration that was created by the Westmore Weston Health District. Uh, and they say, get your backyard in the zone. And uh, this really encourages homeowners to create a tick safe zone where you can recreate with your family with minimal exposure to ticks in their habitat. So they recommend that your place where you recreate is in the middle of your lawn, where it's cut short. Uh, where it has higher sun exposure, uh, that you don't recreate in the tick zone, and you keep uh, areas that may be uh, liked by ticks and their hosts, like uh, wood piles, bird feeders, sort of away from your tick safe zone. In addition, uh, it's recommended you put in a three foot wide tick barrier, we call it a dry barrier. So it turns out these ticks are extremely sensitive to desiccation, that is drying out. They need a very high relative humidity to survive for any period of time. And so if you have a drier barrier where lawn meets woods, these ticks will not survive crossing it. They need a relative humidity uh, of about 90%. In the lab, when we keep ticks alive, we keep them at over 95% relative humidity. So out here in the lawn, ticks cannot survive very long. In the same way, if a tick is crawling in your house, it will not survive a very long time. It just does not have the humidity to do that. You might also choose plantings that are deer resistant that discourage deer from coming uh, by. Some people also like to install a uh, deer fence. The recommendation is eight feet or taller, so deer cannot go over it. Um, if you do this, you also need to uh, gate your driveway so they have no way in. Uh, this has been shown to reduce tick abundance in homes that are only fenced if they are over five acres. So there's several methods of chemical control. I'll cover them briefly. Um, one, one method of chemical control is by applying what we call an area-wide acaricide. Basically, this is by spraying pesticide, and acaricide just means a pesticide that kills ticks. Uh, we also have a couple of methods of rodent targeted <coughs> tick control. So for, uh, for acaricides that are what we call synthetic pyrethroids, and there's all different types of chemicals, bifendrin, carbaryl, dopamethrin, cyfluthrin, um, and we know from the studies that a single application in the late spring, early summer, so like late May, uh, has been shown to control the nymphal ticks uh, from 68 to 90%, depending on uh, the study. And so actually the synthetic pyrethroids are the most, they're the strongest. The thing is, uh, they also have a lot of non-target effects, so they, they kill all arthropods. So you have to spray responsibly uh, just at the, at the edge of your property. And if you have water on your property, it's not recommended to spray this, because uh, we don't want it in the water. You may have seen some of the like organic tick control uh, companies, and typically what they're talking about is something we call natural pyrethrins. Uh, these are extracted from botanicals, things like chrysanthemum. And so in the lab, they've been shown to kill ticks, but they don't have such a residual effect as uh, the pyrethroids do, and so uh, there may need to be multiple applications. These pyrethrins haven't been very well studied, and so we don't have a lot of data to show how long they work for and how many applications are actually needed. There's some other new options on the horizon, and I think we'll be seeing more of these in the next uh, couple of years. One is called Lucatone. It's an Alaskan cedar extract that's toxic to ticks. 
as well as a fungus known as metarhizium uh, that has just become uh, commercially available that's also very expensive uh, that doesn't have so many non-target effects, meaning it seems to be very specific to killing the tick. So we may be hearing more about that. But we do know that the caricides, like uh, the synthetic pyrethroids, like bifenthrin, uh, reduce black-legged ticks for up to 41 weeks following a single application. Okay. And we also know from a recent study uh, here in Connecticut that about one in three Connecticut households in Fairfield County um, are using pesticides to uh, treat ticks. If you're feeling like nobody does that, actually, people do. Um, we published a study recently that showed no reduction in human disease despite a reduction in ticks. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Does it mean we shouldn't spray? Uh, it may mean that we could reduce ticks in your backyard, but when you go to someone else's backyard or your children go to someone else's backyard, you may be exposed to ticks that uh, have not been killed by a backyard spray. Rodent targeted tick control focuses on killing ticks where they meet the host. So here's the Max Force bait box. I think it's called something else now, the TCX Select System. We also see Daminex tubes. With the bait box, mice run in to eat a bait, and they're treated with Fipronil, which is the same thing that's in Frontline that you treat your dog with. Mm -hmm. um, it kills the ticks on the mice. With the Daminex tubes, you can place these around your yard as well. Uh, the ticks run in. They have, uh, they're filled with permethrin-treated cotton that the mice like to use for nesting material. So they take the cotton back to their nests, and then they treat the whole nest of their families. And so you can buy the Daminix tubes at local garden centers, probably Agway and uh, Depot, and you can place these at various <coughs> intervals. I think it's 10 meters apart along the edge of your property. Uh, the bait boxes are not available for you to buy and apply yourself. Um, there's a patent on this bait box, and the only uh, applicator is currently Connecticut to control. Excuse me, would yes. you know if the Dominic's tubes are safe for dogs? Yeah, if the you dogs. Have a, them in your yard, um, they have yeah, it's unlikely that a dog could get into it. Yeah, but um, uh, chew it or. Uh, you know what? I, I wouldn't recommend that your dog eat permethrin, but, but there is a treatment of permethrin that you can put on your dog for shelling ticks, so in small quantities, topically, it's fine, but of course, eating permethrin. Permethrin is not safe for cats. I'd be worried about that more than the dog, um, because dog, cats ingesting permethrin, actually, it can have lethal effects. Thank you. Okay. So, lastly, in addition to chemical control and landscape modifications, we can focus upon creating a barrier between humans and ticks, okay? And so you may have heard of many, many personal protective measures over the years, right? Performing tick checks, wearing long pants, light colored clothes, bathing after spending time outdoors, tucking your pants in the socks. You do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I do wearing repellent, uh, wearing clothing treated with permethrin insecticides. So these are some personal protective measures that you may have heard of. Well, now I've told you all these things, right? There's no vaccine, you can use tick repellent, you can do all these your other repellent, you can do landscape modification. So it sort of feels overwhelming, right? Like what are you gonna do? I have this whole toolbox, and where are you gonna pick from? So we actually evaluated this. We did this huge study from 2005 to 2007 here in uh, Connecticut, including in communities here in Fairfield County. So we looked at people who got sick with Lyme disease and their neighbors who didn't, and we asked them all about what they had done in the month prior to becoming diagnosed with the rash. Uh, so we studied all these variables about personal protection, all these, uh, we looked at all the factors that they may have uh, done for modifying their landscape and, and what their landscape looked like, and we also, of course, measured whether or not they treated any one of these methods. So, huge study, we call it the mother of all case control studies. It took us three years to complete, so what do you think? Hold on, I gotta start it. Okay. Let's try that. What do you think was the most effective Lyme disease prevention measure? The answer is C. Yeah. 
It was bathing. See, glass is doing its job because it's true. Because before, prior to 2007, that wasn't even a recommended measure. And someone had said, oh, why don't we put that in the survey and see if people do it? And it turns out that bathing, within two hours after spending time outside, was protective against Lyme disease, to our surprise. We didn't expect that to turn up. And uh, it actually reduced disease by 58%. I know. Well, this makes sense because, of course, we like it when people bathe. <laughs> it's not expensive. This is a common sense practice. And it makes sense biologically because bathing, of course, is an opportunity to check for ticks. Okay? It's an opportunity to wash off unattached ticks. If a tick's attached to your body, it will not wash off in a shower if you go swimming. But if it's yet unattached, it will. Um, it's also an opportunity to remove tick infested clothing. Okay? So, this is a common sense inexpensive practice that you can do within two years, which two, two years, two hours after spending time outside. Don't wait two years. <laughs> um, so it turns out, in addition to bathing, performing daily bodily tick checks within 36 hours after spending time outside uh, was also protective against Lyme disease. And so this also makes biological sense because we know uh, that studies tell us that the ticks really don't transmit the Lyme bacteria until they've been attached at least 24 hours. And even between 24 and 36 hours, very few ticks that are infected will transmit the Lyme bacteria. And really, we get worried when ticks have been attached for more than 36 hours. And so, if you can check your body within 36 hours, uh, your chance of acquiring an infection with Lyme bacteria is very low. So check every day. Again, it doesn't cost anything to do. Uh, it's a common sense practice. One other um, finding in our study was that applying repellent uh, was very marginally significant. And so, uh, unfortunately, we didn't know what type of repellent people used because they weren't sure themselves. But the recommendation, and what we know from entomologic evaluations of repellents, is that uh, the most effective repellent against ticks is a deep that's at least 20%. Other products have some repellent effect, but at, for a more limited time. So if you apply something like a lemon delicious, uh, like there's many commercial products for these types of botanicals now, they need to be reapplied more often. And in terms of how often they need to be applied, there's very little data about that. So just know if you choose a botanical repellent, you're going to need to apply it more often uh, than DEET. But DEET, uh, while you do need to reapply it, it will last at least several hours. So I think this is my last question for you. If you do find a tick upon you, hopefully you won't, but say you're doing your check every 36 hours. right at the surface of, of the skin and pull straight up. 
Now, people say, I don't want to leave the head in. This is actually impossible because ticks don't really have a head. But what they do have is a feeding tube. It's, called, it's a mouth part called a hypostome. And it's barbed like a, um, like a fishing hook. That's what makes them very hard to remove. In addition to that, they secrete in their saliva a cement-like substance that holds them in very well. So there's a chance that you might leave the mouth part partially in. But we know from studies that if you use the tools, the tick tools, there's many kinds. There's a tick key, there's this little lasso thing my doctor showed me. I use this. Your graphs are going to be Well, we actually, we've studied these in the lab, and we can look at the mouth parts, and you see that removing them with tweezers actually is more likely to pull the mouth parts out. If you leave the mouth parts in, your body will react similarly to it would to a splinter. You get inflammation, you might get a secondary infection. So we recommend some neosporin, you know, you wash it, Band-Aid, and usually it works its way out. Okay. Do not light it on fire. <laughs> you think that people don't, but they do. Okay, if you find an attached tick, here's what you can do. And actually, so this happened, this is last summer, this is my, this was my four-year-old. And um, this was on her back. It's funny because I handle these ticks in the lab every day, and I'll tell you when you see it on your child, it really takes your breath away because, I, I mean, I, I'm not afraid of a tick. I handle them all the time. I work with this stage of the tick. We collect them all summer. And yet seeing one there uh, is really something. It surprises you at how tiny it is, even on your small child. So if you do find one, here's, a, here's an attached nymph. Here's an attached, uh, partially engorged female adult. I know our local health department here uh, will take your tick. You can submit it to the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, where they will test it for not only Lyme bacteria, but some of the other pathogens. Uh, they've had sort of a quick turnaround now, uh, such that you'll get your report back pretty quickly if you feel that you want to use that for some sort of uh, diagnostic or treatment. And that's something you can talk about with your, um, with your doctor. There is a study that has shown that taking a single prophylactic dose uh, within 72 hours of a tick bite, uh, and that dose is 200 milligrams of doxycycline, uh, can reduce uh, Lyme disease infection by about 80%. There so was one study, it was only done in adults. Children cannot take doxycycline. We don't know if a single dose of amoxicillin will work, um, but it might be something you can talk to about your doctor if you find a tick that's been uh, feeding for some amount of time and has been engorged. So here's some other things you can do that are easy and don't require you to erect an eight foot deer fence. As I told you, the ticks, they dry out and they don't survive in a dry place. So when you wash your clothes, uh, you can dry, dry your clothes on high heat. If you're washing them and then drying them, you need to dry them for about one hour in order to kill the ticks. Another thing you can do is you can take your clothes uh, off after you've been outside and put them right in the dryer. And if they're not wet, uh, you only need to dry them on high heat for about 10 minutes. That's another practical thing. And not only might it kill the ticks that are there, it might give you the opportunity to remove the ticks from your body that haven't yet attached. Okay. Um, it's becoming increasingly clear. In fact, I know there's a study that's going to be coming out fairly soon that implicates household pets that go outside as a risk factor for Lyme disease. Particularly cats are of interest in this way uh, because not only do they, you know, we keep we keep dogs intact with these invisible fences. You know, cats that go outside can go into all of the underbrush, and they have very good grooming habits. Uh, so they can come into your house and bring the ticks, and they can then uh, groom those ticks off, offer themselves onto you. They can sleep in your bed um, and bring them onto you. So there's many, uh, there's many tick preventive treatments, and if you have dogs and cats, you need to talk to your vet because depending on what animals you have, some work for one but can be toxic to the other, and vice versa. Some are applied monthly, some are topical, some are taken as a pill, uh, some are collars. I have to tell you, I love the, for my own dog, I use the Soresto collar for eight months. Um, I love it, I haven't found a tick once. Another thing you can do is spread the word. And we actually know this for many studies, not just about Lyme disease, but about disease prevention in general. And that is, uh, people don't tend to take preventive action against disease until they or someone they know is getting sick. And so, obviously, you're all here, so you're interested in taking preventive action. Um, but you can tell people who may not be thinking about it um, what the risk is and perhaps one of the methods to 
uh, try and prevent. Uh, and as I said, the internet, of course, is sort of a uh, the internet is a place where you can find a lot of misinformation, but you can also find a lot of great information. Recently there was a, um, it was a picture floating around the internet of the tick nest in your backyard. Have you seen that? Mm. It was really like a bunch of seeds for some berry, but you're not going to see a tick nest in your backyard. It's not going to happen. But these are some really great um, <coughs> scientifically based uh, tick prevention web resources. And of course we have our own blast program that's chock full of really great information, so that's a good place to go. Uh, if you ever want to get in touch, we'll talk some more, and I think we're going to do questions a little bit later because there's one more thing to do here. Um, you can always shoot me an email, and I have cards here, and uh, we'll never eat a reason. All right, thank you. Great information, isn't it? And uh, well, just getting back to uh, Lyme Connection and, and all that we're doing to try to help spread the word. Uh, my name is Amanda Dranow. I'm a Lyme Connection volunteer. And I'm also uh, the co chair of this library series of events. Um, so, this is, as, as we all know, a really serious issue, and it would be great to have everyone here start our social media campaign that has been generously donated to us uh, and designed for us, Lime Connection, by Discovery Communications. Uh, uh, it's a program called Creating Change. So we had the good fortune last fall to be selected to go down to their headquarters and meet with a creative team who designed this campaign for us uh, to bring back to our community and start sharing. So. Without further ado, let me give you a, a quick tour through this campaign that we'll be launching. Okay. Oh, sure. And, and also, Nita will have. Okay. One more. Taking photos. Yeah, that's good. Good. We'll do that, and then Nita will also entertain uh, some questions right after the work through here. But I'll be. Yes, we'll put that up. Sure. Are we all set? Okay. So moving right along, uh, I just thought I'd give you a quick tour, and then these will be uh, appearing on the Lime Connection uh, Facebook page, uh, also the Twitter and the Pinterest that we have, and we would love for you to share them with your contacts, uh, like them and share them with everyone you know, because it's a, it's a great way to get the conversation rolling, and it's a great way to create some real buzz, but also, uh, also share some real information. So. Uh, getting to their campaign. It was really great fun working with them. They're a great group of people and uh, they took this really seriously. They were really wonderful to work with. This first part of our campaign that you'll see coming over the internet will be called Harm's Way. Uh, they created this visual for us. We kind of thought that had a, a, a ring of truth to it. I mean, why would we let our kids go out without Lyme disease protection? So. And this is the third. <laughs> it usually gets quite a uh, response. But anyway, so you'll be seeing that this summer, or in, actually in a couple weeks. The next uh, is, is series to this campaign is called House Guests, and this kind of gets to Nita's, some of Nita's points, which is really this tick becoming bigger than life itself. Yeah. But it does kind of hit home. I mean. And this actually uses our BLAST acronym, which is kind of cool. We'll couple this with our BLAST information, that's standing for bathe, look, uh, apply, repellent, spray, and treat. Where's the other one? That is the classic <laughs> icky one. And then we have this. is the British guys uh, who came up with this kind of fun <laughs> side matters. And this actually, as you notice here, is the overarching theme of our campaign this year. But we thought this really kind of struck home. And then the last TikTok gets to the timely treatment. It's crucial.
So these will all be posted, and we'd love for you to share them. But uh, without further ado, we are actually going to launch this campaign right now with our social media guru, Kate Fitzpatrick, here tonight. And uh, Kate, have a, a step up. Confirm Kate Fitzpatrick, social media, and I want to say public relations consulting. Yeah, if you have your smartphones and you can pull them out, that would be fantastic. And I'll just walk you through how to spread the word. Because as Nita and Amanda said, it's just so important that we have a blue screen. It's important that you see our Facebook page right now. Um, <laughs> linking back to the Line Connection website so again people can get that prevention information. And the Pinterest is also <coughs> just backslash Line Connection. So please do try to get in the habit. We're all on social media way more than we like to admit. Just take 30 seconds a day and, and the more we can share, especially this time of year, the more people we can help. So. Does anyone have questions on how to share, how to, to do any of this good stuff? <laughs> thank you. Right. Thank you, Kate. Sorry, you don't mind if we um, 
because I was taking photos, but they're not like as good as yours. Can I just literally copy from? You can copy yeah. or just share. You know, if you click that share button, okay. that's the best way because then people will be able to come back to Lime Connections right. page for more information. We're always really careful. Like Nito was saying, there's so much information out there on the internet. We're very careful about what we post. So that way people will become more aware of the organization if they're not already. And they'll hopefully like the page and, and we'll spread the word that way. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> any, uh, if Nita will take any questions for this one. The dry barrier around the yard. Yes. Is it mulch, gravel. Yeah, what okay. So mulch works. Gravel's better. Wood chips, if you do mulch or wood chips, they eventually get very wet, so you need to replace them. Mm -hmm. So if you could do it every year, that would be good. Gravel is ideal, but it doesn't necessarily look as nice. So that's your choice. Good. Yes? Um, did you say something about the deer fence not being effective if you had more or less than five acres? Uh, so there was a study that looked at tick abundance in, um, in residences that had deer fence. And so there was no significant reduction in yards that were less than five acres. And maybe because when you have a space that small, uh, the hosts can come in and out in a way that it's still a small enough space that it amplifies and really makes a large number of things. We don't know. Um, but does it mean that having a deer fence is a bad thing? No, it may reduce them somewhat, but not. it wasn't a significant, they weren't significantly different than houses that didn't have them. I, at our last house, we had a deer fence. I thought it was great because like plant house does and all sorts of things. Uh, but in terms of erecting it simply to prevent ticks, um, we know that deer fencing, is, if you don't already have it, it's pretty it's pretty expensive. And um, and so if you want to do it, really the most bang for your buck is if you're going to fence in a more than five acre area. Good. So, yeah. Other question, actually, has there been any uh, study done on effectiveness of products like uh, Frontline and others in terms of getting infected uh, by ticks that have been brought in by the pets from... So do you mean, I'm sorry, is the, are you talking about studies that showed that people who used Frontline on their pets were less Correct. likely to get disease or that their Correct. pets were less likely to get disease? No, I'm talking about the human being. Oh, um, so in the prevention study that we conducted, we asked about treating <coughs> pets and it didn't show up as protective at all, um, but not, not everyone in the study had a pet. So I think maybe our sample size wasn't very large, so there hasn't been a study that large specifically about that. With that said, the bait boxes that I showed you has the same chemical as uh, Frontline, mm. called Fipronil, and so that presumably kills the ticks on mice and, and uh, reduces the number of ticks and the number of infected ticks on your property. And so we actually just finished a three-year study of 625 households here in Connecticut and Western Connecticut, including here in Ridgefield. So we haven't looked at the data yet um, in any way to tell you if it reduces human disease. Uh, but stay tuned because probably we'll be able to tell you within, within the year. So, yes. You said that ticks don't live very long. Um, so if they do come in on your clothing and yes. your clothes are in the laundry basket, how long will it live? Oh, good question. Depends on the condition in your laundry basket. So <laughs> if you were out there gardening and you're yeah. nice and sweaty okay. and your kids came in and they're all sweaty and it sits, um, <coughs> they probably live till the next day, perhaps. Oh, okay. Um, but, I, you know, it really depends. Are they dropped in the carpet? Are they dropped in the hard floor? Um, but in general, they're not going to live like a week. People say, oh, there's ticks all over my house. I saw them on the walls. Right, right. That's really unlikely. <laughs> like, people send me pictures of ticks all the time. My friends here in town are like, there's a tick on my wall. They should send me a picture, and it's really a beetle. So I think sometimes if you don't know what to look for, it's really easy to mistake that. Do you use it 24 hours if, the, if it was damp in the laundry basket? Yeah, I don't know. It hasn't been studied. Well, that's a good study. Maybe we'll do that this summer. We'll put various treatments of damp clothes in the hamper. I don't know, but I would say probably a day at least. Yes. So you mentioned that the adult tick, which latches on to the deers, are, I mean, does the adult tick actually latches on to multiple uh, people as well? Like, so if it can come off a deer, then can it go to? No. I don't know, so no. it's only one time. One right? time. Each stage feeds once. It only, it's a three host tick. It takes three blood males in its life. So, I mean, if, if deers are not really carriers as well, what you said, 
So why do we blame deer more than... Yeah, yeah than I know, and that's sort of a misnomer, and that's, uh, we tend to call, in it's the scientific field, we call it the black-legged tick. We call it the deer tick because that is what its primary host that helps sure. it reproduce. So deer are very important in the life cycle because mm -hmm. they help the tick reproduce. Yes. And so the abundance of ticks is related to how many deer there are. Sure. But the infection in the ticks is related to the mice. Mice. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have a random question about the tick boxes. Just I was thinking about this the other day. Yeah. Does that affect birds of prey? Affect birds of prey. Meaning, oh, if, if they, the mouse if goes they, through and is covered. I know. We so have. yeah, I mean, we've had this question before. We don't have any um, evidence that it does anything. In the same way, if your cat eats a mouse, um, but I think that the dose that we use to treat mice is very, very low such that, that any sort of toxic effect of uh, fipronil ingestion by a cat or bird of prey would probably be quite unusual and it's, it's too low. It's too low. I, I, wouldn't, I don't know that it's been extensively studied, but I know that concern has come up before and we have no evidence that it's dangerous. In fact, these boxes too, when they put them in their yard, the EPA requires they're covered in a metal shroud so that animals can't break into them and chew up the bait and, and eat any of that. I was wondering when you mentioned that deer seem to be um, have something in their systems that prevents them from actually developing Lyme disease. Has there ever been any research using mm -hmm. like deer, you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah. you know some of the Oh, yeah. uh, you know, I know. This comes up a lot and we don't really know what it is. Yeah. So it's hard to isolate that. In the same way, like uh, one of the main ones, in fact, I was just telling Jennifer earlier, in the southern US we have this tick as well. But we have a lot less transmission of disease. And the, one of the reasons is that one of the main hosts of the immature tick is this lizard called the Western Fence Lizard. And it's also, um, it clears the infection, just like the deer do. Mm -hmm. And so it really doesn't lead to this amplification in nature. Mm -hmm. And so we don't know what it is in the deer. We don't know what it is in the fence lizard. Just like if a mosquito bites someone with HIV, the mosquito won't maintain the infection because mm -hmm. the mosquito clears the infection in some way. Yes. Does it go deeper in your skin? Does it go deeper in your skin? No, did you see the picture that I put up? Just it has a feeding tube that's like a straw and it inserts its straw and that's all, that's as far as it goes. It's not too bad. <laughs> yes? It's kind of related to that question. If the feeding tube, like for example, I pulled a, a tick off of my young son and I did everything I know I wasn't supposed to do. We were on vacation. I didn't have tweezers with me. And most of the body parts kicked off in my fingers. Okay. The feeding tube was left under the skin. Okay. We brought him to a doctor who removed that. Okay. Can that, can you in your lab, can that be tested for Lyme? Or is that just not enough sample? Well, so test the it's feeding so tube. so small. The um, little parts that was no, the doctor removed. No, because yeah. there wouldn't be probably, in the way that we test the ticks, uh, we test for the DNA of the bacteria, right. and so if you said that it wasn't, there wasn't any there, it doesn't mean that there, the tick wasn't infected. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Same way, like, if a tick is broken and we test it, it may show up negative because it, we didn't detect it in the piece mm -hmm. that we had. So you um, need the, that's why you, you need, need the entire, entire tick. I mean, if you break the mouth parts off, that's no problem. You can still test the tick. Um, but if the tick is broken, we can test it and then say, if we know it's positive, we know it's positive. But right. when it's broken and we say it's negative, it's with a little bit of a disclaimer, which is, yeah, maybe it was positive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if a dog gets a tick um, and it's engorged, um, but, okay, and it's engorged, but it, when it, if it comes off, it's not going to feed again. Yes. But if you treat your dog with that, um, chemical, yes. and a dog, your dog brings a tick into your home, mm -hmm. then won't that tick, if he's been treated, drop off into your home, say on the couch, and then he's still looking for his meal? Okay, and this is a great point. Because yeah. I don't treat my dog for that reason. Okay, so here's, it depends on what treatment you're using. Okay. So the front line, you apply it to your dog, it goes into the sebaceous glands of the dog, and now what happens is the tick has to attach to the dog and start feeding. And only after it starts feeding is it exposed to the pesticide, and then it dies within a few hours of feeding. Okay, so that's the front line. 
The thing about frontline, though, it means that a tick can come in on your dog and not yet start feeding, and you can pet your dog, and now you've got the tick up your sleeve, right? And so there's that. The tick has to attach to die. So if the tick hasn't attached, it's gonna, if it doesn't have a host and you're there, it, why wouldn't it? But other, <laughs> other tick uh, pet products can do things like they can repel the tick. So for example, uh, it, Canine Advantix mm -hmm. is a Promethean product. And so that you can put on, the, on your dog, and you can't put it on your dog if you have a cat, because the cat is toxic to cats. You can put it on your dog, and it works very well, because not only uh, does it kill the ticks if they contact it, it actually repels the ticks somewhat. And so that's better. And even if that tick is on the dog, the dog is exposed. If that tick falls off and hasn't fed yet, it's probably going to die within 24 hours. It's not going to feed upon you. Okay? And that's the same for the Prometheum treated clothing. A tick is on the clothing, and even if it crawls up the clothing and onto your body, it's probably going to die, even after a minute of exposure onto the clothing. Yes? But that Intel here says that Frontline just doesn't work anymore, that it's not that effective. So it's funny you say that. And so sells a band. Okay, so I, I, my experience with Frontline hasn't been so great either. Um, and I don't use it on my dog primarily because I didn't want it to come, I don't want the chicks in my house at all. Um, but we're actually studying this right now in a project with CDC because we don't know if the ticks are growing resistant to Vipronil because it's actually Frontline is the most commonly used tick control product. So over time, it may be that they're becoming resistant mm -hmm. to the product. I know that I was treating my dog every three weeks instead of every four weeks. But it may be human error as well, right? So if you don't get it right onto the skin, it's not applied in the correct dose. Um, if you don't apply it, it's human error and it's not the, the chemical. Right, so if you take a pill, that's less likely to have a problem with something that requires you to put it exactly in the right place. Yes. What about cats? What about cats? Oh, no Do you find is there another product that, that is available for cats that have a problem? Yeah. So there, there's actually the collar, the Soresto collar, is available for cats as well. Your cat will wear a collar. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I don't know. There may be. I don't. I'm not. I don't know a lot about cats, and I'm not that tapped into the veterinary world. Only what I know about having a dog and being concerned about ticks have I done my investigation. But if the, the collar actually is is flumethrin, and I know it's safe for cats and uh, very good. Frontline, and she's 16. Yeah. Well, great. So maybe it's working better on the cats, or maybe you can apply it better on the cats, or who knows. I, I don't really know the answer to that, but that's a good conversation with your vet. Yes? One more question. Um, you said that the tick has to be attached for like 12 or, or 12, 24 or 36 hours for it to start salivating. Uh, other infections which we have written in here, do they transmit quickly or faster? Or, yes. Um, they do. Yeah. Okay. They do. Um, and so some of the infections, we don't know how long it takes. The really scary one is the Powassan virus, because in the laboratory, we know that it can transmit, like, in 15 minutes. Um, with that said, Powassan virus is very, very rare. It's very, the ticks are not very likely to be infected with that. Um, the ones we care more about are Anaplasma and Babesia, and they, those may be transmitted in less than 24 hours. The exact timing, we don't know. Um, some have said six, some have said 12. Um, most people who get Babesia infection tend to be, um, I think the median age is 64, and uh, people who are being compromised in some way are actually very um, more susceptible. People who don't have a spleen are also very susceptible. Uh, but anaplasma, if, you, if you've had it and you know someone who has, uh, people will say it's like the worst that they've ever felt in their life. They feel like they've been hit by a truck and you can actually be hospitalized for that. So certainly, preventing a tick bite or an encounter with a tick in the first place is the best thing to do. Because <coughs> even though those infections are more rare, they, they may be possibly transmitted before 24 hours. Yes. Thank you. How far and fast can a tick travel? Yeah. So like, I just keep thinking about like the mice with the ticks. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a mouse in your house, and the tick either drops off, or it's caught in a mouse trap, and it drops yeah. off at some point. Can it run upstairs? Yeah. And no. And so the mobility of a tick is very limited. To, it might move a couple of meters, a few meters. It doesn't move very far. Uh, it moves up and down quite well. And that's how it looks for our host. It climbs up the vegetation and waves its legs. And, and when you walk by, and our host walks by, it grabs on. They don't jump, they don't fly. They don't fall out of trees. They're never even that high. The highest they'll be is like deer chest height, right? And so 
Um, if it's in your house, it probably won't go very far. The real mobility of ticks depends on the movement of the host. So where mm. the mice carry them, where the birds carry them. So uh, back to the, 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 the laundry example. So if you've taken your clothes off and you put it in the wet laundry basket, yeah. in your, let's say in your laundry room, okay. that's not going to walk, uh, they're not going to walk into the rest no. of the house. I found ticks in the laundry basket. They stay put. They're going to hunker down. If their humidity isn't what they like, they're just going to stay put. They don't want to go anywhere unless it feels just right. Yes. Just so I understand, uh, you're saying the tick collar that you mentioned, is that a repellent or it kills also? It's both. It's permethrin and That's it has it. repellent properties and it has uh, tick killing properties. And so what happens is, like we have, in fact, Jennifer has some tick repellent clothing in the back. And so what happens is if a tick actually falls upon it, they are repelled. They'll curl up their legs and they'll fall off. I see. Okay? And so in the same way uh, with, with the collar, it, it's not permethrin, but it's a permethrin derivative, and it, it has that effect. So the chemical is an Advantix, is that what you said? So Advantix is permethrin. I'm okay. sorry, the collar Soresto is called permethrin. It's related, but it's safe for cats. So, but my question, the collar is in the neck, so how does it repel the other part well, of the Well, so thing? it has a slow-release chemical that actually absorbs into oh, the skin. Oh, God. Okay, the, Thanks. The dog. Yeah. If your dog swims a lot, then you can't actually, you have to apply it more often. So the clothing you're speaking about, I mean, what does that do to our body? Yeah, that so happen? that's a good question. So there's been studies of dermal absorption of permethrin into the skin from clothing, and it's been at a very low rate, much lower than you might be exposed if, say, you treated yourself or your child for head lice, because that's permethrin, too, with the, with the light shampoo. Um, or for scabies. If, if people get infection with scabies, they use a much higher concentration than you would be exposed to uh, through, the, through the clothing. Um, mm -hmm. I think that if you think about things that are, that they actually, like, the clothing that's there has been impregnated by a company that uses the technology to to put the permethrin into the clothing, and they bind it in the same way that they, you might bind a dye. So you think about the, the clothing mm -hmm. that you're wearing, mm -hmm. and it's blue. Right. Well, you know, you wouldn't want to bathe in the blue dye, right. but you feel okay wearing the blue <laughs> yeah. dye impregnated and dried into your clothing. Mm -hmm. You can also get... Um, you can get a permethrin spray, and I don't know, Jennifer, do you have some back there? Um, I do. You can, so the cool thing about the permethrin treated clothing, if you buy it from the company that makes it in, in commercially available clothes, it's good for 70 washings. Well, they say that's about the life of the garment. Uh, if you apply it yourself, depends on the product, usually it's good for about, I think, six washings. And uh, you can feel, actually, we have some of the clothing here. It doesn't feel like anything. It's not greasy. It doesn't smell. Um, I just came back from a Caribbean island. I was worried about Zika virus in my family, and so I put all my kids in permethrin treated clothing, treated sun hats. I had a treated blanket. Um, yeah, when I if I'm choosing between potential tick-borne disease and, and something that's an EPA approved chemical that's been studied in terms of its toxicity, I, I go with the I go with that. Yes. So I just want to point out that a lot of these vendors that we're talking about are going to be at the May 19th event. So oh, okay. At West oh, great. Well, there you go. So if you want to learn more about it, I don't promote any product in particular. I just, these are ones I know I've used myself and I feel okay. I'll put it on my kids. It's not a problem. Anything else? Yes. So, um, Corinthian versus the deep. Well, yeah. Is, is that better compared to the deep? I mean, I, I know you just said you won't. Oh, okay, yeah. so, well, I can tell you what the science says. Yeah. And so, it's, it's apples and oranges, right? Because this is actually, will kill ticks. And the other one repels ticks. And you have to apply it more often. Um, and it works better on skin than on clothing. Um, so if you're wearing clothing that you want to treat, for me, it's the way to go. Um, my feeling from just anecdotal use is that the Prometheus treated clothing works a little better than the deep. Uh, but I, I, we're testing the deep right now in the lab, and we're seeing efficacy up to four to six hours, 25% uh, commercial product. Um, and we're comparing that to some of the botanicals like geranium extract, lemon eucalyptus, and we're only seeing a couple of hours of repellency with that. So. And D is approved actually for children, babies, two months of age and older. So there's that. Go ahead. Aren't some of these products carcinogenic? If you spray your property, I've heard that it has a, it's not good. Yeah, so I think in general there is a fear of chemical pesticides, and understandably so. I mean, I don't want to coat my, my whole yard with pesticides. I think that there's, um, 
I don't know of studies that show the pesticide, the pesticides that we talked about have a direct link to being carcinogenic or causing cancer. I think that, um, I mean, I, I care about the environment and I care about the health and safety of my family. And I think that the way to apply a pesticide in your property for ticks specifically is to target it just to the environment where we know that they live, which is right at that wooded edge where lawn meets woods. Um, I don't know of any studies that particularly say that. I know with the DEET, there have been some, some studies, a handful of studies that have shown that some people have had toxicity from DEET exposure through, usually it's ingestion. Um, but as we know that different people have different sensitivities to chemicals. And so I think that, you know, we know that a lot of these, these prevention measures have been studied. So what happens with the BLAST program is they take, they took the five most well studied things that we know are based in the literature that we know are protective against tick bites or reduce tick populations or prevent disease. And so if spray or chemicals don't make you comfortable, then don't do it. Check every day and, uh, and bathe. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks so much for coming this evening. Stay tuned for our next uh, event at uh, Western Connecticut State University on May 19th. Uh, that will be a patient-focused event, uh, very informative if you know someone who has Lyme disease. And then the next event here will be on May 25th, and we look forward to seeing you there. It'll be a very interesting event. Uh, we will uh, showcase some Ridgefielders who have dealt with Lyme disease and who are dealing with Lyme disease. And we're doing a photo portraiture exhibit as well as having an interview with a Lyme doctor, a, a doctor who treats for Lyme disease, Dr. Daniel Cameron. So we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you.